there are lots of questions coming up now and I think we can join everyone and I try and uh, keep track now of what's coming on. Um, there are quite a few questions uh, uh, related to pulmonary uh, stenosis. So obviously, uh, it is a, a lesion that can be easily missed antenatally, if you, particularly if you don't use color uh, and if the heart looks nearly normal at uh, uh, 20 weeks. So one of the questions is, can pulmonary stenosis be diagnosed, diagnosed on the three-vessel view? So that's open to the panel. Uh, maybe everyone wants to answer. Um, can I pick that up first? John? Um, I think it, it, unfortunately, my answer to that is it depends. If we take the grayscale view, the black and white view, with pulmonary stenosis, the size of the pulmonary artery is highly variable. So if the pulmonary artery may be small, uh, where you've got severe obstruction. Sometimes, actually, the pulmonary artery, beyond the valve, the pulmonary artery can appear prominent if you get some post-stenotic dilatation. So I don't think on grayscale there's a very reliable way of picking this out. If you are looking fully, you should use color flow Doppler to see aliasing of flow across the pulmonary valve supplemented by measuring the velocity. And in addition, you may get a clue by looking at whether there is anti-grade or retrograde flow in the duct, because if there is severe pulmonary valve stenosis, you will begin to see retrograde flow in the duct. But the size actually of the valve and the pulmonary arteries is quite, is quite variable. So there's not a cutoff you can use to detect that lesion simply on that view. Any other views on the subject of pulmonary stenosis on the three vessel view? That will lead me to another question is, do you measure the pulmonary artery and the aorta on the three vessel view as a kind of routine mes me measurement for anyone in the panel? Uh, I, I don't do it. I just, I just look at them by uh, eyeballing and measuring I do uh, at the fourth level. But if you are uncertain, uh, you could do it. Uh, but if you have a lot of experience, I, I don't think you should measure it in the three vessel view. So I'll be controversial and say we do. A part of our policy is when they come to us, we will measure the three vessel view. We'll measure the, at least the size of the distal aortic arch um, just to document that that is uh, within, normal, within normal limits. Uh, it's not so difficult. The machines have got their Z scores already built in. So as you as you make the measurements, it'll come up and tell you whether the measure is average or whether this is bigger or smaller than it should be. But at a minimum, we would do the distal aortic arch and very often the duct in the same view. So we've got the comparison of the say, of the two. I do agree with Monique that if it looks plumb normal, it really does look normal in experienced hands. Is there? A, a huge additional value from making that measurement? Well, you could question that, but we, we, do, we do it as part of our routine. I'm just going to be controversial here because there are two different views and the question specifically was on the three vessel view, which I think the answer is probably no, because there are no normal data for the three vessel view. I think your answer goes a little bit beyond, which is the three vessel trachea view, which you already discussed in your talk. So right. I think of that is right. a value particular if you think of coaptation, but I agree with Monique as well that, you know, if you experience, you kind of know, like you look at everything in the baby and you don't measure necessarily everything, but there's nothing to stop anyone. If you want to get confidence that you know how to assess, start making some measurements, you get a feel for the measure and then you start concentrating on that. And then you get the experience to see just by eyeballing, are they more or less the same size? The pulmonary artery just a little bit bigger. And if you're in doubt if it's very big, there are Z scores for the pul main pulmonary artery. So you can see if that falls within the normal range or not. But I personally don't measure it routinely, only if the pulmonary artery looks, looks the dilated usually, not too small, dilated. Well, now, I'm going to keep... Uh, Jade, yes, please. No, no, it's just it's the same. I mean, I agree with you and uh, Monique. So we, do, we don't do... As per routine, only when uh, you have uh, some questions that we're not sure about the, the discrepancy between them. Well, I'm going to stick to the pulmonary stenosis. As I said, I was a bit interested in that. Uh, sibling with pulmonary stenosis, 
if you are scanning a lady that you know had a previous baby with stenosis, what else do you offer additional scans for that pregnancy? And if so, uh, what's the kind of policy? I do. I do. I will offer an additional scan at, let's say, uh, 32 weeks. I do as well, around 32, 34 weeks. John? We do as well. It's, we're, we're in agreement, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> we are all in agreement with that. <laughs> Yeah, no, no controversy there. I think, you know, not just for aortic history of pulmonary stenosis, but history of uh, aortic stenosis and coarctation in, in our policy is to do a late scan. Usually it's just for reassurance of the family, because if you don't see really in detail, scan much. But pulmonary stenosis is a bit tricky. Sometimes, you know, uh, you do come across something that manifests a little bit later more than the aortic stenosis, I think. So no, no questions on that. Can, can, I, can I just add one thing? And I'm actually going to ask Monique one thing. Uh, do you, because we are, I mean, myself and Monique, we are phytomedicine specialists and you and John are cardiologists. So when you say that you offer an extra scan, means that you are offering an extra phytoechocardiology scan. Yes. And we, yes. when we yes. say that we are offering another scan, means that we are offering, um, it. If people can understand that we are simply offering a third trimester scan. So we are talking about offering a, a fetal echocardiography scan, isn't it? Yes. yes. Correct. Because, and I think now some of these cases, the previous history might have been a postnatal diagnosis uh, of pulmonary, critical pulmonary stenosis, for example, that was missed at 20 weeks. So I think it's more for uh, anxiety of the family, so they know that you know nothing's going to develop during the pregnancy. So uh, most of the time, it is a reassuring, but it is a fetal echo where you remeasure the velocities across the pulmonary valve or the aortic valve, or reassess the coarctation if that's the case. A population so, that is that is specific at risk for pulmonary stenosis are uh, TTTS. Uh, fetuses that were treated for um, uh, monochorionic twins that were treated for TDTS, and then you can then you can see the development of pulmonary stenosis even uh, much later in pregnancy. Correct. Now there is one specific question for uh, Monique. It's about the uh, if I understood the question correctly about the angle of the septum and the left ventricular outflow tract in tetralogy or fallow, uh, if you think that that angulation is in any way a sign of tetralogy or fallow. Yeah, I, I think what they mean is uh, the cardiac axis, and that is true. In a lot of uh, fallow cases, the cardiac axis, so the angle between the ventricular septum and the midline of the chest uh, is enlarged. Um, so that is a good remark of the audience. Uh, that is that is a way to trigger you to the diagnosis of fallow. Or any other, if it is a cardiac accident they were referring to, it is for conotronchal abnormality, and it's quite yeah. typically that the trial of it could be coarctation as well. So uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, a specific question for John about a linear attachment of the AV valves. Uh, in, in VSC, but I guess it's saying in atrioventricular septal defect. By linear, normally we expect that the, the mitral and tricuspid valves are inserted at slightly different level. And when you see a linear attachment, it means the mitral and tricuspid valves are inserted at exactly the same level. Now in an AVSD, there will be bridging leaflets, so there will be no differential insertion of the valve, which can also give a linear type appearance. Um, just because the attachment is linear, so there's no different insertion, doesn't make it an AVSD. And that's why I said that in addition to associated defects, if you can get views of the sore, short axis of the valves, that's sometimes challenging, that can help to work out the morphology of the valves. But that's what I mean by linear attachment. It's quite frequently seen in babies with trisomy 21, even without associated 
actual abnormalities that, the, that there's not a proper differential insertion of the AD, AD valves. And also in conotronical uh, defects, the differential insertion is less than in normal uh, hearts. That's correct. There's a lot of work from the French group uh, looking at even without an atrial ventricular septal defect, just having a linear attachment. Uh, it's very difficult to see the offset in conotron, particularly transposition, uh, and also as a marker for chromosome abnormality, even if you don't have, so it's slightly dysplastic valves with the valves more or less at the same level. Um, I think we may have a minute or two to uh, try and browse through a couple of questions. Uh, the best way to find a septal defect is to look for it. <laughs> Great. Yes. <laughs> I, I think it's really uh, dependent on the on the intonation angle. So you should use different intonation angles for your four chamber view and use color Doppler. That that would be my advice. And not to stay only in the four chamber view, but make a sweep through the whole heart because you have to realize that the four chamber view is only um, a, a one or two millimeters in uh, of the total uh, septum that you are examining at that time. So move your probe, use color Doppler, and have correct settings of your color Doppler. You should lower the PRF a bit. Yeah, seeing the PRF, uh, you know, particularly if you're looking at the apical portion, uh, and if from the four chamber, you should do a sweep from the back of the heart, very slowly until the level of the four chamber, and then moving on to the outflow track, and the PRF lower if you are looking more at the apical portion, the muscular portion, and when you come into the perimembranous areas, maybe increase your PRF because the velocity starts to increase in the, across the left ventricular outflow tract. So a little bit of adjustment of color. But I think the clue is to not to stick to just one image, is to do a sweep for the whole septum because otherwise you're gonna miss uh, a ventricular septal defect, both outlets and, and, and posterior defects as well. Um, we, we, are, we agree again. I agree, yeah. Good. Um, there was another question about, do you advise against assessing the heart if the baby is on their, babies on their side or prone? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. You have to take what you get and uh, you need to learn to work around the uh, baby. There are actually some things, for example, left ventricular outflow tract, you can see very nicely when the baby is spine up. So it's not true that all views are bad if the baby is spine up. And I think you have to uh, really, you know, move your probe a lot to try and get different angles of insonation. Um, and occasionally, obviously, we need to try and get the baby, the, 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 uh, the baby to move if we can. I guess we used to ask mothers to cough, but we don't do that anymore. Um, and uh, certainly not in COVID times. And um, we, you know, it, but it's not true that you can't assess the baby in a particular uh, lie. You have to work with the way the baby's lying and you adjust to the way the baby is, um, is lying. There may be some areas that you simply can't see with babies who are particularly awkward. And my only tip for that is, is the golden rule is don't report what you can't see. If you can't see, you just can't see. Uh, don't get lured into reporting something to complete the scan if you just can't see it. Uh, I think if I may, one more question, that's probably for you, John, about what, what's meant by an unbalanced AVSD. An unbalanced AVSD in the simplest sense is that where the size of the ventricles appears to be markedly unequal. So um, where either the left ventricle is small and the, or the right ventricle is small. And the implication is that normally we would look for an atrioventricular septal defect to repair the ventricular and atrial components and the valve, but we would be septating the heart back to the two sides of the heart. So to a normal two ventricle circulation. If an AVSD is severely unbalanced, that may be impossible. So it may impact on what you say about the longer term prognosis. And equally, so for example, if you see 
right ventricle dominance and a small left ventricle, if you have normally connected great arteries, then you, you really need to look for associated lesions like um, uh, coarctation, for example, in the case of a small left ventricle. Or if there's evidence of heterotaxy, which fre frequently coexists with unbalanced ABSDs, then you need to look for all the malformations which be associated with isomerism or heterotaxy uh, as part of the complete picture. Yeah, it can be quite complicated, the unbalanced AVSTs, isn't it? So I think we actually, we probably, you know, answered quite a lot of the questions. Uh, and some of them have been answered directly. I'd like to uh, thank you, all the um, speakers. Thank you, Canon, again for organizing these. And I hope the uh, participants, I'm sure the participants would have taken a, a lot of information from uh, this uh, very good session. Thank you very much again. Mm -hmm.